Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are doctors Sarah and Alicia, maternity physicians and moms who have been through it all. We want to empower you with knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. She Found Health and She Found Motherhood is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Found Health and She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any of the institutions with which we are affiliated. Some of our podcast episodes are sponsored so that we can keep getting great info out there to you, our listeners. We only partner with companies that we truly believe in. Some of our links and suggestions may be affiliates and we would appreciate you using them to help fund this important work. Now let's get to it. Good morning, Andrea. Hi. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here today. Yeah, me too. Thank you for reaching out. So I thought we could just start by you telling our listeners just who you are and a little bit about the work you do and maybe how you got into this work. Sure. Yeah. So I am a clinical psychologist. So I've been studying treatments for anxiety and depression basically my whole career. And so I, I was in sort of academia, the world of academia, doing a lot of research and science on treatments. And I just felt like I really wanted to make more of an impact with my work. I wanted to bring the kinds of research that I was doing more into the real world and help people who were really needing help. And so I left academia and I've been in the world of digital mental health for a little while. And so I founded my own company about a year ago that focuses specifically on supporting moms. And so I'm a mom myself. I have been through the uh, sort of pregnancy, postpartum period, experienced my own challenges along the way, and really just saw that there are very few resources out there for moms. And so I wanted to create a, a program that really is designed specifically for moms that brings the most effective treatments and interventions for anxiety and depression and other kinds of challenges like rage and birth trauma and all kinds of things that moms can face. Oh, that's so wonderful. And it's so needed. It's interesting. I don't know how old your children are, but mine are five, eight, and nine. I also experienced really severe postpartum anxiety with my first, particularly second wasn't as bad. Third, I had it under control that time. But it's just interesting now. My oldest is nine. He'll be 10 in November. And just how much more talked about it is now. And and yet, we still have so far to go in terms of the shame, the stigma, and the resources. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's more awareness, which is great, but I think there are still just a lot of challenges with getting connected with support. I think when people talk to their doctors, they often just go to medication right away, but a lot of moms don't necessarily want that. And there's nothing wrong with medication, but a lot of moms don't want to do medication. And so finding access to resources that are affordable that are available in your state or in your area that are perinatal focused is just really hard. Yeah, it is really hard. And so I'm so excited we're talking today. I thought it would be good to start for just for folks that might not be familiar with um, some of the symptoms that people might be experiencing. Because I know one of my dear friends um, said, in hindsight, I clearly had depression, but I didn't know it. Because it wasn't necessarily like she didn't have a depressed mood. She had some of the other symptoms. So I'm wondering if you can talk through what people might experience if they are having some perimental anxiety, depression. And we can dive into the rage topic a little bit because I think that's not talked about enough too. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say the most common things that we see at Prospera that we support moms with are postpartum anxiety, postpartum Mm -hmm. depression, and postpartum rage. And so I can talk about each one. So postpartum anxiety, I'm going to start with that one, actually, because it's the most common. Believe it or not, people have heard of postpartum depression, but people don't really realize that postpartum anxiety is actually a thing that's very common. And so postpartum anxiety often looks like just a lot of anxiety and worry. It can be about different kinds of things, but most commonly we see anxiety about the health or well-being of the baby. Is my baby going to get sick? Is my baby going to die of SIDS in the night? Is my baby breathing? Am I doing a good enough job with breastfeeding? If I go outside, is something going to happen? So just a lot of worry about the well-being of the baby. 
Um, there can be anxiety about lots of other things as well. If you're noticing that you're constantly worried or anxious, you don't feel present with your baby, you're just, you're really not enjoying motherhood because you have that sort of elevated on, like elevated anxiety, feelings of on edge, that's the postpartum anxiety. And then there's postpartum depression, which is a little bit different. And so that's feeling down or depressed, low motivation. It might be trouble getting out of bed. Also, that feeling of just not enjoying motherhood, just everything feels hard. So that's more sort of depression presentation. And then there's a third area, which is pretty different. We do see a lot of this, which is postpartum rage. So this is where you get you get really angry. It goes from zero to 100 in a very short period of time. It feels like you don't have control and you're just going to explode. And usually that results in yelling either at your child or at your partner, doing things that you very quickly regret and feel guilty about. Yeah. And I'm really glad we're talking about this today because I actually personally don't know what to find about postpartum rage. I think it's something that we're just newly starting to actually understand. And so I'm wondering in your experience or in your history, you know, you did a lot of clinical research, which I also love research, but is it, can it be isolation or do people always have either anxiety or depression and rage? I think it can be in isolation. It definitely can be that someone's having challenges with all three of those things. It might be two of them, or it could just be like, I'm just reaching these boiling points and that's the only thing that I'm having. So I think it can differ by person, but maybe most commonly you might see yeah. multiple things go together. It might be anxiety is the main thing, but then that leads to this irritability or having trouble controlling anger. Yeah. Yeah. And how commonly do you think you see rage in your clinical practice? I would say the most common thing is the anxiety, postpartum anxiety. And then I would say actually postpartum depression and rage are similar in frequency. Wow. Yeah. 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 So clearly we need to be talking about it more if it's that common. Yeah. And I think people are embarrassed and they don't, they feel guilty for having that because it's so different from the ideal mother, the sort of nurturing and warm and kind. And instead, they're screaming at your kids and it just feels so, yeah, so uncomfortable. It feels awful. Yeah. And I'm sure there's so much shame around it. And so just in and of itself, us talking about it and normalizing it as one of the sort of postpartum mental health conditions, I think will go a long way for some people. Yeah. Yeah. And what about intrusive thoughts? Where would you slot those in terms of do people with rage get intrusive thoughts or is that mostly anxiety related? Yeah, intrusive thoughts are much more connected to anxiety. So, so we have a, a common person that we see who has a lot of anxiety and worry about the, the well-being of the baby alongside these intrusive thoughts of something horrible happening to the baby or mistakenly doing something that harms the baby. And then sometimes people really, they only have intrusive thoughts and that's like the main thing and that's really terrifying and horrible. and they want help with that. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely had intrusive thoughts with my anxiety and it's so distressing. Yeah. I had them too. And they at least 70% of moms have them. So they're very normal and common. And for some people, they're so distressing that they want help and support. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of us, we just have them and they're just there and just what, what the heck is that? <laughs> yeah. You have to identify it. Remind yourself it's intrusive and let it go. But yeah. Yeah. And I think the important discriminator is a normal, and I always tell my patients this too, and I'd love to hear your perspective, but I always say like a degree of anxiety is normal. It's protective. Like we are meant to worry about our children to keep them safe. And you think back to our brains when we were living in the plains and having to protect them from much more worrisome things than we do today. But what I always say is it's when it becomes debilitating or it interferes with your ability to care for your child or enjoy your child or go about your day-to-day -day activities, like that can be one of the differentiators of normal, I'm doing quotes here, normal anxiety versus anxiety that you need support with. And I'm wondering what your sort of thoughts are around that. Yeah, I think that's a really good question of what, when is this yeah. normal or when, when is this something that I should get help with? And yeah, I think yeah. that point of feeling like this is interfering, maybe it's causing arguments between you and your partner because you're not on the same page about things or you're worrying a lot about things or I think another thing that I often hear from moms is like they don't feel present. They feel like they're so worried all the time that they can't yeah. be there with their child and enjoy them. And so when you're getting to that point where that those experiences of anxiety or depression are making it hard to enjoy that period, and obviously it's hard. So you can't, you don't enjoy it 100%. But if you're not enjoying it, 
then that's that's a good time to reach out. And I say, let's have a low bar. Um, yeah. Because something like our program is affordable. It's coping skills. It's very low effort, low energy thing. And why not give it a try if it can help? Great. If it gets better on its own, then that's great too. Yeah, I agree too. It's like that. Why wait until you're really unwell, really having significant symptoms to seek help if you're experiencing it? Start yeah. to explore. Because like you said, there's lots of options and I can't wait to hear more about your program, but there's lots of options that aren't just medication, right? And right. sometimes like, I don't want medication, so I'm not going to seek help. Exactly. Yeah. And then talk about rage a little bit more. If someone comes to you and that's their sort of primary symptom, what, what sort of steps do you walk them through? How do you counsel them? And what resources and tips do you offer? Yeah, this is a great question because so our team is very focused on science and research. So everything that we do, we're going to the scientific literature and saying what has been shown in the research will help with this. Mm -hmm. And so when we realized that we had a lot of people coming with rage, we said, okay, let's go to the scientific literature and see what you know, there is. Yeah. And there's not a lot. And so it's just not something that's been studied much. So we pulled from sort of anger. There's definitely treatments for anger and things like that. So we pulled from that and it involves basically three steps. So the first step is looking at thinking patterns that are contributing to anger and rage understanding thinking traps and then trying to change or reframe some of those thinking patterns that are going to be fueling and continuing your experience of anger and rage. That's the first step. The second step is to look for triggers. So mm -hmm. what are the specific situations where that anger really comes up? Is it that my partner isn't helping? My child is not listening, trying to get out of the house in the morning because we're rushing and we're late. So there's certain situations where you are probably more prone to rage. And then the third is coming up with ways to actually interrupt in those moments that mm -hmm. experience of rage, keep it from getting to that boiling point. And these are things like breathing practices, image imagery or visualization, coming up with a kind of a mantra to calm yourself down, calming your body, removing yourself from the situation, mm -hmm. things like that in the moment where you can do to stop it from getting to that point. Yeah, it's so helpful. And I think important to know that much of this treatment, yes, you may go on to need medication, but a lot of it is just learning coping skills and like getting to know ourselves better, right? In terms of identifying those triggers and then noticing those physical symptoms at the early onset of before you go into that rage. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I hate that medication is usually the first thing that people are given as the option. And, and I understand it because it's easy. You just write the prescription, you pick it up and you take a pill. It's really easy, but it's hard to find good quality behavioral interventions, which is why I found it Prospera. Um, yeah. And so people don't realize that actually medication is not the first line treatment for yeah. something like anxiety and actually probably less effective than some of these behavioral things. But unfortunately, it's the first thing that's given. Yeah. And I think it's hard to there's so many factors. Like one thing, I just came from a weekend gathering with a group of women and female identifying physicians. And the big focus of our weekend was just community and connection. And one of my colleagues was actually, we were on one of our little Gulf islands here. We have these beautiful little remote islands with her newborn and three other female friends. And she was commenting how much easier it is to mother in community. And I think we, we miss a lot of that in our culture. And I think that's something that we can't fix overnight, but I think that's something that can be contributing to some of our experiences, right, of perinatal mental health when we're doing so much alone without the support of a lot of us live away from extended families and some people are new in communities and just don't have those connections. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is one of the things that we do. We're often trying to support moms around is how to basically get more help, whether mm -hmm. it's starting with your partner, like asking your partner mm -hmm. for more help because mm -hmm. they're, they're not doing as much as maybe they could be. And then are there other people who you can get to sit, take the, the baby for some time so you can go and, and do things, take care of yourself and help yourself build your own identity that's separate from being a mom. And so then it might be finding support groups or figuring out how to feel comfortable leaving your child in other people's care, right? Because if you're just doing it 100% on your own, it's impossible. It's incredibly hard. Oh, it's so hard. And to, to your point, these skills that I 
we'll talk more about your program, but that I can't wait to hear more about it. But these skills, when we have some programs not perinatal related, they're so important, not just for parenting and mothering, but for life. And I think sometimes we feel like a bit of a resistance to do the work, right? It, it is, you do have to commit and you do have to do some work on yourself, but you'll reap the benefit lifelong, right? Whereas medication are great and very important in some cases. And some people are so severe, they need medication and then they can do the skills. But for many people, if you put the time in now, you'll have these skills lifelong. Whereas if you, all you do is take a medication and you stop the medication, the, the symptoms without those skills and those strategies will recur. Yep. And that's exactly what the science shows and why I was saying earlier that specifically for anxiety that, that these behavioral interventions are more effective is because often what happens is, yes, the medication works, but when you try to stop it, then you don't have any skills on board. And so the anxiety returns. And so when you do have the skills, that has actually a longer lasting effect, less likely to see that recurrence of anxiety over time. Yeah, for sure. Like for me, I know I was in a place where I was so debilitated with anxiety. I couldn't have done anything. So I started medication and it worked quite quickly for me. And then I started to do the practices and I was then I was able to do it. And if I had reached out earlier, I don't think I would have needed the medication. I think I would have my anxiety was still low enough that I could have done the work and done the skills. So I think that goes back again to your point of have a low threshold for reaching out for help. Yeah. And I think what you're talking about is also really important. And this is something that the science says. And so, of course, we do in our program, which is that you need to set goals at the beginning and you need to check in on those goals and you need to track the symptoms. So we have mm -hmm. symptom tracking, we have anxiety, symptom severity, depression, anger. And when we track that throughout our work with a client, and if those things are not changing, you don't feel like your anxiety has improved, then we need to start talking about whether we want to try something else. And that might be medication. Yeah. And so it's really important to know whether what you're doing is working so you can decide if you need to try something else or change something. Yeah, that's such a good point. Hey, Sarah. Yes, Alicia. Did you have any problems with newborn sleep? Oh my gosh, I sure did, especially with my first. Me too. I wish I'd known more about what to expect going into it. I know, and I wish that I had known to create a sleep plan with my partner. I know. How can you support each other to get the sleep that you need while supporting your little baby? Totally. So guess what, guys? That's why we created the Newborn Sleep 101 course. In this course, we discuss what does newborn sleep look like? And how can we help support that sweet little baby to become the best sleeper they can? While also supporting you and your partner as you navigate this complex, sleep-deprived time. We talk about how to set up your nursery or your bedroom to optimize both your sleep and your newborn sleep. And we also start talking about how you can start implementing routines and schedules into your day and your newborn so that by the time they're three or four months, it's well-established. Because guess what? That's when they start to really need it. If you're interested in learning more, head to our website, www.shefoundhealth.com courses. We hope that you get better sleep than we did. <laughs> and so we've talked about common symptoms and tips and tricks and when to seek help, which is early, folks, early. <laughs> Talk a little bit about your program and what, what you offer folks throughout their journey with you. Yeah, so our mission with Prespera is to basically remove all barriers to moms accessing the highest quality mental health support. Mm -hmm. And so our program is, as, a, as I've said before, we specifically focused on moms. We provide actionable coping tools and skills. So unlike a lot of, a lot of therapy that our clients have had before, we aren't just talking. We're not just a nice place to talk. Like we'd have that, of course, mm -hmm. but we have a digital tools library. We have dozens of tools that actually allow you to practice things between sessions, we're very focused on giving you these coping tools so that you can really see improvements in what you're experiencing. And so our program involves weekly sessions with perinatal certified mental health coaches. Um, and so you meet with your coach over video, um, and then your coach gives you activities to work on. So you work on those activities from the library, and then the coach will meet with you the next week and kind of review what you practiced. Um, and so what other things? So in terms of removing all barriers, we are available across the entire U.S. So you don't have to be in a specific state. Um, and we also are offering at a very affordable cost. That's one of the biggest barriers. Yeah, um, is it cost. really is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we offer, we have a trial period of two weeks 
um, at $19 per session. And then from there, $39 per weekly session. Um, that's that's so far affordable. Lowest. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. therapy is like a hundred plus dollars per session, right? Often. Yeah. Yeah. For a perinatal therapist who really specializes, yeah, at least $200. Yeah. Wow. And so in terms of accessibility, are you available for Canadians too? We are actually. Yeah. 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 Amazing. And I love that you're digital because I think with A, it makes it accessible outside of your local area and B, it's really hard to leave the house if you have a baby. Yep. Yep. So we have moms breastfeeding on the call. You just try to fit it in into your life. You can do it from the car, whatever. Amazing. And then whatever, for some people, they are not really noticing their symptoms or they are experiencing rage in particular. I think it's one that probably will go uh, unchecked and unsupported for a long time because of the shame behind that. And also just lack of understanding that there's actually something you can do about it, that you're not just an angry mom, that you um, that it's a mental health condition that we can support. Um, can people reach out beyond that immediate postpartum stage? Is there a limit as to or are you open to all mothers? Yeah, we support people all the way from trying to conceive through years postpartum. I think we had a mom who was nine years postpartum and realizing that she had birth trauma. And so she wanted to address that. And I would say most of our clients are coming to us in that postpartum, anywhere from four weeks to one year postpartum. But we will accept people in lots of different stages. We actually had a a dad sign up with us, even though all of our messaging is around moms. Our tools are they work for lots of different stages and different challenges. So, Oh, that's great. Yeah. And I, I had forgot that you had mentioned birth trauma. And I think that's so important. We didn't really start talking a lot about birth trauma until the past couple of years in, our, in the work that we do. And I think I've come to realize that trauma is in the eye of the, the beholder or the experiencer, right? And as a provider, it's not my place to say whether it was a traumatic birth or not. So I think just really for people to know, and I'd love to hear what your thoughts, but that if you, if your birth in reflection, if you felt traumatized, then you have birth trauma. Yeah. And and labor and delivery is unfortunately a perfect storm for trauma because we all go into it knowing that it's dangerous, right? We know that people die, right? And so when you have complications and a lot of people have complications at various points or challenges or things that are not going according to plan. If you have moments where you're afraid that you're going to die, you're afraid your baby's going to die, that's the the classic trauma definition. And so it's very common for moms to come out of labor and delivery with that experience of trauma. And I think there's this huge focus on, oh, at least the baby is fine or at least you're fine. But that has nothing to do with trauma. And so sometimes that can be really invalidating of, wow, I had this horrible, terrifying experience and everybody's just saying like, everything's fine, but I don't feel that way. And yeah, we hear that a lot. People are afraid to label it as trauma because everybody was fine, but it was. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, for any providers listening, that's really important to know and to check in with your patients and your clients about what their birth experience was like. And then for any postpartum or pregnant people that are listening, if you're not sure, I would encourage you to reach out and whether that's reaching out to you and your program or reaching out to your provider and explore that. Because if you think you had a traumatic birth, you probably did. Yeah. And I would say the most common way that moms start feeling like this is interfering is when they're thinking about having another baby. And it could be a week postpartum and they're already thinking like, well, I wanted to have another baby, but I never want to go through that again. And so that confusion around thinking about subsequent pregnancies um, is often what leads moms to seek us out. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I think it's so amazing what you're doing and the support that you're offering people. And I'm excited. There are finally now, we're just normalizing the experience of perinatal mental health, whether that's anxiety, depression, rage, and trauma. So where can people connect with you and find out more about the services and everything that you offer? Yes, we, like I said before, try to remove all barriers. So we make it super, super easy. So you just go to our website, which Mm -hmm. is prosperamhw.com. It stands for mental health and wellness. So prosperamhw.com. And then we have a free phone consult. So that's the first step for everybody. We can do the free phone consult. We have 30 minutes and just talk with someone on the team. 
And then from there, if it seems like a fit, then we get you started with the trial and go from there. Amazing. We'll put your um, website in the show notes below. And do you have any social media or blogs or newsletters or anything that people can connect with you on? Yep. Yep. So, well, we have a couple things. So I, I'm on social media a lot. I'm posting a lot of information about all different kinds of things. So my, my handle there is Dr. Andrea Niles. So you can definitely connect with me there. You can send me a DM if you have questions or anything like that. And then we also have, so like on our website, there's a, it's a postpartum pitfalls guide. So if you can oh, put in your email yeah. and you want to get our free guide, we have lots of tips for um, that postpartum period. And then we have lots of emails that go out with different information about different kinds of postpartum challenges. So you can get on our email list there. Okay. Amazing. Thanks so much for connecting with me today and having this really important conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Sarah. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.